um, I started my Taekwondo training in 1972. I was in high school and the fellow classmate said, hey, this teacher at the high school, he's teaching karate at night. You want to check it out? And we were into weightlifting and all sorts of fitness stuff. So we figured we'd go check it out. And it turned out he was teaching Taekwondo. He was not teaching karate. Right, and right. He was actually affiliated under one of the pioneers, Han Shak Yo at the time. And his name was Greg Ustra. He was a teacher at the high school. So I was surprised to see many of my classmates were in the class. And I figured out that if, you know, I'm training for all this fitness and strength and all that stuff, maybe I need to know how to use it efficiently. So I signed up for the class, which was in the evenings at the high school. And later the television show Kung Fu was on. So the martial arts craze got bigger and bigger and he opened up a storefront school. So we all went to the storefront from that time. And uh, basically fast forward a little bit to 1974, I was a color belt and there was a black belt test at the school and officiating at the test was uh, the gentleman who later became senior Grandmaster Sarah, along with pioneers Nam Tae Hee and Han Shak Kyo and some other people. And following that test, the United States Taekwondo Federation was actually formed with Nam Tae Hee, Han Shak Kyo, Bob Olympian, Bob Mathias, and several other people at the helm. My instructor, Greg Ustra, he was put in charge of educational programs since he was a teacher. And uh, from that time forward, I stayed with the United States Taekwondo Federation. Although, as you know, not long after that, General Choi went to North Korea and basically all the Koreans left him, including Nam Tae Hee, Han Chak Yo, et cetera. Yes. Although I think informally they maintained their ties and Han Chak Yo, I think, married the general's niece and, and whatever. They were very, they were still friendly. So I continued training with Greg Ustra from the United States Taekwondo Federation. Uh, and I trained with him through 1987. I got my fourth degree. And he decided to retire and I took over the school with the help of the other black belts. Um, and then at that time, basically didn't really have an instructor, although I would still invite him for testings and things of that nature. So I had the opportunity in uh, 1990, uh, the USTF was hosting General Choi for an instructor's course in Colorado. So going back to the early days when even though there was a 1965 book, nobody really had it that we knew of. And then in 1972, the next book came out and we did get a hold of that. Okay. And to the credit, unlike a lot of the senior Koreans, who you didn't ask questions of. Uh, we, if we could ask, say to him, listen, sir, we're doing this, but the book seems to say that. And, you know, this instructor says this, and that instructor says that, and the other instructor says the other thing. He says, unless the book has a clear error, we're going to follow what the book says. Yeah. So that was always our fallback position. And uh, even when I went away to college in uh, 1975, I trained with a Korean gentleman in Miami, Florida. I started calling school saying, who does Chun Ji Tang et cetera, and found a Korean gentleman, Kim Suk Park, who had the WTF flag on the wall, but the general's book on his desk and was still doing the Chang Hun patterns. And he actually had me run one of his schools for a short time, even though I was only a first cup. He was getting ready to sell it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So in 1990, I went to that instructor's course with General Choi, and my attitude when I went was, well, what am I going to learn? I'm training with some of the top guys in the country or maybe even the world, yeah. and you know they're always with the general, and they got to be teaching me what he wants. And I took notes at the course for two reasons. Number one, since I was the senior rank in my area, I wanted to make sure I had down what he said. And some years earlier, I had gone to a – event called the Karate College with Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, and Joe Lewis in Chicago. And Jeff Smith, to his credit, said to everybody, he said, why aren't you guys taking notes? He says, you're here for three days. In a few months, you're going to remember like three or four things. You should all be taking notes. So since that time, whenever I had the opportunity to take notes, I took notes. And I wrote down 150 things that I needed to fix based upon what General Troy was teaching. And a lot of times, a little voice inside my head would scream, that's wrong when he would say something that was different than I learned. Of course, it couldn't be wrong because <laughs> he was the guy. Yeah. And then if I go back and look at the book, 
He was, it was exactly what he said. You could see how as things got passed from person to person to person, either details got left out or things got changed or, you know, different things had happened. So uh, that was that first course with him. The next course I was better. I think I only had about a hundred things I wrote down. I had things. <laughs> the problem somewhat became at that point, you know, computers weren't widespread even in 1990. We didn't have a lot of access to them. I now had all these different notebooks. So when computers became more available, since General Choi always taught the same way, he would teach fundamental techniques, he would teach patterns, he would teach some step starring, go on to more patterns, et cetera. My notes were always in that order. So I was able to correlate all of the notes from the seven instructors course and other seminars, et cetera, yeah. to see if he was consistent, if anything changed, and I found that going through the seven courses plus seminars and all my notes, he was like 98 plus percent consistent right. in what he did. And the other 2% I can chalk up to either probably me not making my notes great, or in some cases, you could see how he would be asked a question in English. You know, he translated into Korean in his brain. Then he'd translate the answer into English and it would come out, it wouldn't relate to the question. <laughs> yeah. So I would chalk it up to the other 2%. But when I hear people say he changed this, he changed that, I'm like, not really. He did refine his terminology. He did refine his explanations. Uh, one of the big ones that always stood out to me was the issue of sine wave. My first, before we hit, had the term sine wave that we were familiar with in the U.S., we called it spring style which involved bending the knees up and down. Yeah. And sometimes, or oftentimes even lifting the heels. Later it became clear that you only lifted the heels if your legs were straight. If your knees were in a bent position, you just basically flex the knees. And because it takes me a while to change things that I've learned for many, many years, I actually flew a guy in from the, that was at the course because he was one of these guys who could look at stuff and instantly make changes. I hate those guys. But, so I flew him into my school to demonstrate what General Choi really wanted because he could do it better than I could. And I said to him at that time, even though General Choi at the seminar, the course was teaching up, down, up, down, up, down, there was a relaxation or a slight downward motion first. And I said to this guy, he says, you know, you're kind of going down before you go up. He's like, no, because he never thought of it. Then he started thinking about it. He goes, Yes, but just a little. So it was an instance of where General Tsai's explanation didn't necessarily conform to what he wanted. And Senior Grandmaster Seraph later told the story, without knowing my experience and, and what I went through with this other gentleman, how he was accompanying General Tsai through a tour in the East where he went through like a dozen courses with him. He says it was dead tired, it's at night, we're on a train platform in, in Japan, and General Choi is teaching sine wave, and I see he's going down before he goes up. And I'm like, yeah, I noticed the same thing. Now, I don't know if it was a coincidence if Grandmaster Sheriff talked to him about it or whatever, but in subsequent courses, General Choi would then say down, up, down, down, up, down. So that's an instance of his explanation changed, but his methodology really did. Yeah, no, I remember that. So when you when we, when I started, uh, the sine wave was just being introduced in our school, and we were doing it up down. And then, of course, later it must be similar to what you're saying. Was um, there's the little down first, but uh, since then, it's been sine wave has been misunderstood at some some point. Do you think? I well, I think it's been this. First of all, I think that if you look at current practitioners versus the CD-ROM uh, examples and some other ones. I think it's become more exaggerated, number one. Yeah. Number two, I think that while the term sine wave is unique to General Troy and his system, I think like so many of his terms, it's just meant to be a metaphor. It's just meant to be description. And it's not the goal. It's the something that helps you achieve the goal of using your legs to generate power in your hand techniques. Yeah. If you read basic books on boxing, they say the same thing. In my opinion, if you watch Mike Tyson box, and you see his knees flex, that's sine wave. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not really, the misunderstanding I think is A, thinking it's the goal, B, exaggerating it. 
and C, not really understanding, you know, how it's used to that the whole body, the legs, the torso, et cetera, help generate power in your hand techniques. Yeah, absolutely, sir. I mean, this is very consistent with the grandmasters I've spoken to. Um, uh, very similar explanations that uh, obviously the description of what we're doing can often lead people slightly astray to what the, the end goal is, like you, like you said. And it's a very natural movement that we see in, in sports and other fighting arts. Right, that, you're right. You see it, I see it in tennis players. I see it all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it is misunderstood. So, you know, after 1990, I went through the instructor's course six more times with General Choi. One of the highlights, of course, was in 2002, the last course he was at when he was sick, but he still got out of the wheelchair to teach. And I tested for seventh Don. So for him to call me a master of ice, you know, was, yeah. was a big thing. In fact, in 1987, I tested for fourth band, and I said to the guy I tested with, I said, my goal is to be a master instructor under General Choi. He says, you'll never make it. He's too old. And then I called him, because he had retired, and I said, I guess what, you are wrong. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. then, I, then I, I hosted him in 2000, so that was certainly wow. a great event, because, you know, you're spending time with him, breakfast, lunch, dinner, driving them to the event, driving back to the event, et cetera, et cetera. So... There was, you know, some interesting things, you know, little tidbits going on there. Um, so, but, you know, that's basically, and, and since then I've continued with the USTF. Uh, I tried to stay with the ITF um, and uh, we had a great relationship with Tranquan when he, you know, became the president and uh, went to the World Cup in 04, officiated there, spoke with him there, met him during layovers at O'Hare International Airport. Yeah. Uh, offered to... I was a seventh don, and I, you know, was testing with the USDF, but he offered to test me for eighth don at the World Championships in Argentina, and I declined because I feel like traveling to Argentina for that. And I said, I'll wait till something back in, in North America. And sadly, you know, he got killed in Haiti not long after that. And then in 2010, I submitted paperwork. I, I was an eighth don with under Grandmaster Seraph, but he allowed me to... Uh, keep a foot in both uh, ponds, so to speak. And uh, basically the ITF people at that point, even though I had paid my dues, submitted Don applications, paid them money for that. They took all the money. They gave me a plaque certificate. They said, oh, you're not eligible because you're a USDF member. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> since, since I had helped draft the constitution along with uh, Paul Weiler and uh, Wim Boss and some of the other people, I said, you know, the Constitution says I can't be a member of another international organization. Oh, we changed that. Like, really? You know, Tranquan didn't know you changed it? Really? I, I'm a black holder. You never, nobody ever got noticed that you changed it. So they said, you have to make a choice, either be with the USDF or be with us. I'm like, see ya. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That was unfortunate, but that's, that's the way you got, life comes along. You make your choices. What can I tell you? Yeah, I guess so, sir. Yeah, these things come up on occasion. And uh, like you say, you make your choice. And uh, uh, yeah, I was fortunate to grade under um, Grandma Tran Kwan for, to fifth degree. Um, and uh, so I was very grateful to have met him. And um, and the General Chase seminar you spoke of, where you became master, um, I knew about that. I was, I was due to test for fourth degree. It was in my mind to come across, but I just... One thing or another, I couldn't make it. So that's one quite big regret I would have had because um, there was a lot of people there, wasn't there? A lot of significant. I guess everyone knew it was possibly his last one. Uh, well, I, I mean, yeah, everybody knew him. I think uh, Tom McCallum was there. Park Jung Su was there. Um, Pop Wu was there. There, there were there were a lot of um, you know big wigs. It was like you know I told people when I tested there. I think there were. 14 master instructors are on the panel, no pressure, right? And yeah. there was about 400 people in attendance, so it was a pretty big course. Yes, yes, sir. So you, you spent considerable time with um, senior grandmaster, Chuck Sheriff? Well, I, I spent, you know, a certain amount of time. I don't know, you know, considerable is a difficult term because I'm over a thousand miles away. Right. So my goal was basically to... Um, from 1990 onward to actually go to one event 
a year, whether it would be in Colorado or if he was hosting, you know, general choice somewhere else, you know, to go to at least one event a year that they were they were hosting. Because you know, by the time you pay the plane fare and the hotel and the event fees, et cetera, it adds up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And so do you have any sort of significant memories of, of senior grandmaster? Obviously, sadly, he passed away recently. Yeah. Right. I mean, he I actually, he was on, I went to Russia for the World Championships and he was on that trip. So that was probably where I had the most um, close one-on-one -on -one time with him personally because yeah. you're on the buses and planes and all that sorts of stuff. So that was kind of interesting. And I learned that he liked coins. So when he became a ninth fan, myself and a couple other seniors, we got together, we purchased a U.S gold eagle coin and gave it to him with uh, saying for helping us soar with eagles you know we're giving you this coin um and the one kind of a funny story was one of his favorite demonstrations would be to have somebody stand in a sitting stance and he was you know pretty big guy he was about six two and he would take that big he would do a front kick and take that big foot and plant it in your midsection and propel you backward and he'd always have somebody standing behind, so stand behind him, you know, kind of like catch you or spot you. Right, right. So he was in Chicago because he knew me from some camps and other events. He's, Earl, get in the sitting stance. So I get in the sitting stance. He tells my instructor to get behind me. So he plants that foot and I go propel backward. My instructor deftly stepped aside and let me go fly by. Oh. He didn't get the memo about what he was supposed to do. Wow. So, <laughs> that was uh, that was one funny question about uh, Grandmaster Seraph. A funny a funny question and a funny story. A funny story or interesting story about General Choi was, you know, he was known for having uh, a short amount of patience at some times. But, you know, I found him to be a great guest and went with the flow and did things like that. But as many people know, if he would look at somebody at one of his courses and he didn't like what they were doing, he'd say, who your instructor? And a lot of times, you know, the instructor could have been somebody like well known, like you know, Neil Cho, and he'd go, huh, beginner, or he'd go junior, he'd go, huh, blue belt. Except one time the student said, Nante, he goes, Well, at least you have the right roots. And then uh, one time he uh, was at uh, this was in Canada, and he said, uh, Who are your instructor? Everybody went. Oh no, his instructor's the host. He's gonna say something bad about the host. So he says he says the host's name and general so goes, You must not be going to class enough. Right. <laughs> so it shows that he was a good politician aside from everything else and had an interesting <laughs> sense of humor. Uh, another kind of an interesting story was when I was at the Jamaica course. Oh, yeah. I have to back up a little bit. In Chicago, there's a gentleman named K.S. Shin. And he has a place called East West Martial Arts. He was the first guy in Chicago in the late 60s. Uh, he imported General Choi's 65 book. He's mentioned briefly in General Choi's biography. And his place of business was down the road from my father's gas station. And I had put a taekwondo sticker up on the window there. And he came in once and he's, you know, asking me, like, well, what's that sticker? I said, oh, I'm green belt, you know, or something. So later I started buying some merchandise from him. And, uh, you know, he says, well, I know General Tsai from Korea, blah, blah, blah. You know, every Korean I met always knew General Tsai from Korea, or they were his personal students or whatever. And yeah. one day I'm there with his brother and his brothers in the store who had come recently, whose name is Wan Shin. And it was like the same thing. Oh, I know General Tsai from Korea, blah, 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 blah. So I told him one day, so I'm going to Jamaica for an instructor's class. He says, maybe I'll go to general, I'll go to Jamaica, I'll see General Troy. Like, okay, yeah, right. So I'm in Jamaica and I get a call. This is Juan Shin. He says, I'm in Jamaica. I'm trying to find General Troy, but he doesn't seem to be registered. I'm like, you're here to see him? Does he know you're coming? He's like, no, oh, no. I'm like, oh, no. I'm going to go down in infamy as the guy who like brought this guy to see General Troy. So he says, I'll tell you what, come meet me for breakfast. Every morning, General Tsai comes down and then we'll introduce you, you know, you'll say hello or whatever. And I'm really worried, like, what's going to happen? And that night, honest to goodness, I have a dream that General Tsai walks into breakfast and behind him is his son and some other seniors. Uh, Grandmaster Mel Steiner was there at the time, the host, et cetera. 
And this guy gets out of his chair, wants in an excited manner, and starts running over to him. They didn't know who this guy was. Yeah, yeah. And Mel Steiner takes him out with a wake. That's my dream, right? Yeah. So the next morning, we're sitting at, at, at breakfast, and I'm with the guy, with this guy, Wan Shin. General Tsai walks in, just like in my dream, and this guy gets up out of his chair. And I'm like, oh, just like my, I put my head on his shoulder, I sit him down. I said, let him get his food, let him finish eating, <laughs> and then we'll go over there. And it's kind of hot in Jamaica, but I'm sweating even worse now. <laughs> So he finishes eating. I says, "Let's okay, let's go over there." So we walk over. Oh, he says, he goes, "Is that General Choi's son?" I said, "Yes, that's his son." He goes, "Oh, last time I saw him, he was crawling around on the ground." Now his son is forty-seven at the time, so it's been a little while. <laughs> so I go over there with him, and I go, "General Choi, sir, this is somebody who says he knows you from Korea." And Master Choi at that time, I says, and he says he knows you from when you were very small. They look at him. There's like. No glimmer of recognition whatsoever. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, what's going to happen? Anyway, Wan Shin starts talking. All of a sudden, General Choi's got a big smile on his face. They pull up a chair. They have him sit down. They're really? talking. He's meeting them during the, the lunch breaks at the big banquet. The, he's sitting at the head table with them. In fact, Master Choi was in the middle. He changed seats because they were talking so much. <laughs> and then a few months later, he called me. So things worked out for the best. And then he calls me like a junior. He says, oh, General Choi could come to Chicago in June. You want to have him come and teach? I'm like, well, he was like, can I have General Choi come? Because <laughs> I had to get approval from the cars. Yeah, can yeah. General Choi come to Chicago in June and teach? So I got permission. And that was that was basically a lot of work, but great experience. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so you, you, you've you been to, you went to several uh, of the IICs with General Choi. I went to seven of the IICs where he taught, counting the last one where he was only there a short time. And then I went to a couple of couple day events, one in Arizona, one in Colorado. And then in 97, 97 or so, I don't remember the exact year now, he did a technical conference in Canada where we it was different than that. We were all like basically sitting around in suits and ties and people in the middle were demonstrating and doing different things couple of them were people on the CD-ROM, like uh, Master Pro from Argentina, Raul Kwai, who did the, he was from the Cook Islands, he does Duche on the CD-ROM. So they were demonstrating that he was teaching, et cetera, et cetera. And that was an example of how he didn't always understand the question yeah. because I asked him at that particular course, I said, sir, for our rising block with the outer forearm, we chamber or cross from on top. And in a lot of Eastern arts, they chamber across from underneath. Right. Why did you decide to do yours from on top? So you could see, you know, the process. And he goes, well, it has to do with rotating your arm. And I'm like, I can rotate my arm whether it comes from on top or whether it comes, I don't understand. Then his son started talking to him right. in Korean. Yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, it's just the system. If it's outer form, it comes from on top. If it's inner form, it comes from underneath. I'm like, Oh, okay. Makes perfect sense. But it was just, you know, if his son wasn't there to translate, yeah, might not get the right answer. Another instance was in an IIC who was teaching W-shaped block, and people were doing the stamping motion all different. Some with almost a straight leg, some with a severely bent knee. Yeah. And I asked and I said, sir, how do you want us to do the stamping motion? How do you want us to bend the knee? Some people are doing this, and I charged that some people are doing that. And he was like, what do you mean some people? You have to have book. Don't you have the book? You have to read the book. And I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> but, but in the meantime, his son, who was standing by him, he was basically showing about, he was like showing, not saying anything, but showing like about a 45-degree bend in the knee for the stamping motion. Right, right. So, that was, like I said, that was another example of, uh, and sometimes he would answer a question and it was not connected to the question. And then a few minutes later, somebody else would ask it a little differently. And then you get yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was very much aware of that. I was fortunate to train twice uh, myself, uh, General Che, very lucky, uh, like you say. And, and uh, I've spoken to lots of people now as well that have, that have had the seminars. And uh, as you say, um, his presence was, was one that... Uh, uh, it was very uh, highly respected when he walked into the room. He had a presence about him, would you say? 
had a man. Uh, he, he had a presence about him, but well, you know, basically everybody knew that he was the king of the castle and it was his show and he knew it too. You know, yeah. that was part of the issue, I think, with the early days of Taekwondo was, you know, aside from being the founder of the system, he was the general. You know, with the general, it's like, you don't get to say no. I mean, it's my way or the highway. Yeah. And for some of these people from, you know, who he was trying to unify the system or whatever, they're like, you know, I'm not in the army and I don't have to do what you tell me. And he would just aggravate those people and, and they would not affiliate with him, you know, by the opposite, uh, the op one of the opposite sides of the point was probably, you know, his charisma, personality, you know, that was what held the ITF together. I asked Nam Tehi, I said, sir, I said, knowing the loyalty people have to their various clans or gyms, how is it that so many people gravitated for General Choi and joined the oil clan or whatever? And I thought his answer was very interesting. He says, because nobody else at that time, you know, Sun Duck Sun or whatever, who had taken over the Chung Duk they didn't have any resources. They couldn't do anything. General Choi says, let's go do a demonstration in Malaysia. We got on a military transport. We went to Malaysia. You know, we, we, he had all these resources. He had the government backing. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if, he, if he didn't have that, charisma or no charisma, and what we see in his works, you know, the, the thought process that went by his works, I don't think the ITF or General Choi would have been nearly as successful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, that was part, part of, uh, part of, you know, being doing the right thing. And then what happened was, you know, what he did was, although it was unique to him because he was able to use those resources, his concept basically followed with what Funakoshi did, followed with, you know, what Kano did. They took fragment, they wanted to teach something on a wider scale. They took fragmented systems and created a, a uniform system that could be taught and trained on a large scale internationally or whatever. Yeah. General I was fortunate to be able to also codify, you know, his system in, in the you know texts and also later in the videotapes, CD rounds, etc. Yeah, absolutely, sir. And um, out of the martial art comes the competition. I know General Che had his. Um, feelings about sparring in competition and how it wasn't necessarily a representation of what he was teaching. Were you were aware of that, that how the sport was starting to evolve? In a right. he, he was, not, he never really seemed to be, I mean, he was basically, okay, we're doing the competition because that's what people want. But he tended to think that, you know, certainly the competition only showed a very limited uh, aspect of, you know, what was going on in the system. And that's why we see the cycle of Taekwondo, which has, you know, five elements sparring, which is only one of the five elements. So yes, he wasn't really, you know, that keen on it. Um, so we always have to keep in mind that, you know, there's a difference between combat and sparring, and there's a difference between combat and self-defense, and there's a difference between combat and protection of, all, you know, what they call the personal protection people. Each of those have different goals and different tools. I mean, obviously, self-defense, your goal is to survive. And in combat, your goal is to destroy the opponent. And, uh, you know, the, the story, however true or not, of Nam Tehi, you know, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Chinese soldiers, you know, it's legendary. He was the power guy, but, you know, I don't know how many people, how many Chinese soldiers they apparently found dead the next morning with no bullet wounds or knife wounds simply from being struck with the hands and feet or whatever. Good story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind. You know, people say, oh, General Choi's pattern history isn't perfectly accurate or this story he relates isn't perfectly accurate. Something was brought to my attention in another book totally unrelated to Taekwondo. I think it was called Secrets of Shotokan Karate or something like that or Shotokan Secrets. And the author relates, he says, when it comes to the, the Japanese stories, the point of the story is more important than the accuracy of the story. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when it came to his pattern histories and, and things of that nature, 
the point of the story is more important than the accuracy of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you say, so the, the sport can evolve. It's very popular. It's another way of spreading Taekwondo to the world. But, um, but uh, the essence is uh, what General Che taught was, was is different. Yes, yeah, so, well, his, you know, one of his philosophy, well, I shouldn't say his philosophy, but one of the philosophies he adopts for Taekwondo is one technique for victory. So um, there was actually, I actually read another story about that, the one technique for victory translation, which is okay because that's the point of the story as opposed to the accuracy of the story, was that somebody should have said, you know, one there was, might have been one opportunity for victory. So nice. just because it's supposed to be one technique for victory, if the one punch or one kick doesn't get the job done, okay to have a couple more in <laughs> reserve. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, sir. It's great listening to you and hearing the stories. Really appreciate it, as I said. And uh, so back in the day when you were teaching, uh, you, took, you helped your um, instructors, your instructor to teach uh, the classes. Were you doing the Taekwondo Oath at the beginning, the tenets, or was that something that came in later? Or uh, when it was there, I was in a retail school environment, we did do the oath. The oath was posted on the wall. Um, I don't do now that I'm in a, a park district environment, yeah. and the classes are somewhat shorter. I do not do it. I th sometimes I think about reinstituting it. But okay. uh, I do I do teach the tenants, I do teach the oath, yeah. but we don't recite them at every class. Sure, sure. Do you find that the the, the, the tenants are re relevant to today when we're teaching the, the kids and uh, everybody has? Yes, I think the I think they're certainly relevant. I mean, with what we saw see going on in society, I think if more people try to observe the tenants in their daily life, things could be a lot further along. You know, I'll give you my examples that I use for kids because, you know, attention spans are different for kids. I don't want, you know, after about 10 words, their eyes are glazing over. So I tell them courtesy means to be polite and have good manners. That's it, courtesy. And then I tell them, I says, can you have, be polite and have good manners with people you don't know? Yes. Can you be polite and have good manners with people you don't like? Yes. So. Be polite and have good manners until, you know, there's a situation. We're trying not to get into a situation where, you know, somebody might think politeness and good manners is weakness, and then you got to kind of switch gears. I don't get into that. Integrity. I tell them integrity means to be honest and truthful and fair when you deal with other people. End of that one. Perseverance. Work hard to reach your goals. Okay. Self-control. That's always a good one for kids. Self-control means... Doing what you're supposed to, even if you don't feel like it. Yeah. That's what self-control is all about. And then indomitable spirit means don't quit, don't give up. Kind of hard sometimes otherwise to draw a distinction between perseverance and indomitable spirit. So I try and keep it to a very short explanation for kids. I'm not going to get into the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right away. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Fantastic, sir. And, and if you, you know, I guess we're all sort of, um, uh, we've all experienced the tenants ourselves personally in our, in our journey in Taekwondo. Is there any of those that were relevant to you in any particular way, the perseverance, the indomitable spirit? Well, I found that I have a business where I deal with large members of the public who basically can be, let's say, inconsiderate at times. And I found that if you go up to somebody and you say, hey, you need to do this. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Right, right. So if I instead go to the person, I say, good afternoon, sir. Could I help you? You know, this, could you please do blah, 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 because this is causing this problem. Instead of getting like a 10% success rate, I could probably get a 90% success rate. Right. Out of just instead of, instead of first thing saying, hey, you need to do this, saying hello, good afternoon, please, thank you, etc. So being polite, having good manners in those situations, I find invaluable. Yeah. Doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. It's, yeah, exactly. That, that's, um, 
it is Taekwondo, isn't it? I guess where you you can um, you learn respect, uh, regardless of whether you resonate or like somebody. It's just a, a formal process, isn't it? Of, of well, I can I can. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because when I say ask kids what courtesy means and they say respect, I try to make a differentiation. I mean, and I understand there's a crossover, there's a gray area, et cetera. I said, certainly every human being is entitled to a certain level of respect by virtue of the fact that they're human beings, unless you find out that they're just despicable people and they're not entitled to respect. <laughs> but typically respect is a situation where something is entitled to respect because of something that they've accomplished. Could be their age, could be their station is, uh, you know, in their position at a place of business. It could be a military rank, it could be their educational position, uh, it could be their elected office position, certain levels of respect. But courtesy is something that you give to somebody irrespective of whatever they've earned, their station, you know, what political office, et cetera. So I try and draw that distinction. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you for the clarifying that, sir. Makes total sense. Fantastic. So, yeah, um, so you've been teaching for a long time, sir. You, you still teach today? I still teach today. I started my first class. Uh, I was a first cup, and I was I had a job where I was working Saturday morning, so I wasn't really going out and partying Friday night. So I told the instructor I would take the Friday night class, and that was about 1974. Wow. So I've been teaching continually since 1974 because even when I had an instructor, uh, who was teaching at the school, especially in later years, uh, he was a, an elected official and he would not come to class. And I was the senior rank. I was a senior rank from about 1975, 76 onward. So from 76 till the time he retired in 88, I was a senior rank. And if he wasn't there, I was teaching. Wow. And so you've broadened your range of martial arts, haven't you? you, you you've not just stuck to Taekwondo purely, you've, you've experienced uh, Jiu-Jitsu. Well, yes, Jiu-Jitsu in today's world is a little bit different than when I experienced it. Uh, 1975 or so, we had an accomplished Judo Jiu-Jitsu guy come to the Taekwondo school to improve his striking. Okay. And when we saw what he could do if he got a hold of us, he said, oh, we better learn some of this stuff, too. And he was teaching us. And uh, we were approaching it most rather from a whole curriculum standpoint, although a lot of it was incorporated into our host and school. We were approaching it more from a self-defense situation, like if the guy gets a hold of you this way, how do you counter it, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I think probably in uh, around 19, uh, late 80s, 1990 or so, he became a head, the head of the United States Judo Association Jiu-Jitsu Division. And he said to some, about a dozen of us Taekwondo guys, and he appreciated our work ethic, in some cases even better than his regular Jiu-Jitsu right. guys. Yeah, he said, yeah. you, know, you guys know 80% of my grappling curriculum. Your striking is far ahead of my striking curriculum. Why don't we knock out the other 20% and get you guys certified as you know, a jujitsu black belt. So about a dozen of us did that. And then, but it was completely different than the Brazilian jujitsu uh, universe where so much of it is groundwork. Yeah. Uh, a lot of ours was stand up. And like I said, mostly, you know, it was like, you gotta stick your finger in the guy's eye, stick your finger in the guy's eye. Well, you don't do that in Brazilian jujitsu. <laughs> so um, then, you know, the ultimate fighting championship occurred. And I was fortunate that several of the Gracies came to Chicago for workshops, you know, a couple of day workshops. So um, I was the one with Hoist Gracie, a couple of days. Hickson, who Hoist was the best teacher. He would break things down into component parts. Best out of the people I'm going to tell you about. He would break things down into their component parts and explain it to you in detail, show you different viewpoints, et cetera. Then his brother Hickson came. Hickson was a phenomenal athlete. I mean, he would grapple with everybody that he and his students, and they were just, I mean, phenomenal what they could do. But you had to be a little more sophisticated in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to appreciate some of the things he was doing. 
then um, Helson, which was, was an uncle, came. And again, his stuff was a little bit uh, more advanced as far as picking up on some of the nuances. And then Henzo was, I went to a short seminar with Henzo. And Carlson Jr. had a school in uh, Chicago, and I went to one of his workshops. And, but it was not, I don't want to imply, because later I decided to enroll in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school and found that my mind was a lot more willing than my body. You know, at uh, 60 plus years of age, I was really the old man on the floor. And sadly, you know, I would, I was ready to go home after the warm up sometimes. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and then I found that my recovery period, my injuries were just such that it was like, you know, I'd be able to go to classes for a few weeks and I have to take like a month off for my injuries to heal. And I really, really could not devote the time and energies that it required to um, progress in the system. The other thing I found very frustrating, a couple of things I found very frustrating, and I don't know if it's endemic to the system or endemic to the schools or whatever it is. In Taekwondo, and this wasn't always true, we have a very specific curriculum. You know, I know in the early days it wasn't a specific, you learn this pattern at this rank, but there wasn't a whole lot else about what kicks you learn where and yeah. Etc. And I actually, we actually, I remember it happening in my school. We decided we only have cards on the wall where we list all the techniques for a rank. Later, we ended up with curriculum sheets. Uh, the USTF later out came came out with curriculum books for the core curriculum. Yeah. But in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I felt like okay, everybody is working. The, the instructor's teaching the same technique, and everybody's working on the same technique. And I felt like sometimes I'm working on the roof of the house, whatever, laying the foundation. You know, or you grapple with somebody who's more advanced and you didn't even know what the heck it was they were doing, yeah. let alone what your possible defenses could be. As opposed to Taekwondo, when we spar, our rule is advanced student, you can't do any technique the lower rank student doesn't know. And your intensity can only be about 10% higher than the lower rank because just trashing the lower rank doesn't really help the lower rank. In fact, if you're an advanced student with a low rank, you might be helping the low rank say, okay, try this, do that, do the other thing. I found that to be very, it happened in some of us. I don't know if they took pity on me or whatever, but it <laughs> happened but rarely in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school. Yeah. yeah, quite different, quite different uh, experience for the practitioner and, uh, and the advancement and right. the understanding, and then, I suppose. Yeah. And then when I was in college, the two years I spent at the school down there, it was one of those, uh, what I call typical Taekwondo Hapkido schools. So there was a fair amount of the Hapkido throwing and joint locking, which was really built upon my you know, jiu-jitsu experience. So it was yeah. nice to see some different aspects and things like that. Yeah. Excellent. So and, and you, um, you've had time to publish articles? Yes. I've. Uh, well, I think a lot today in the online world, a lot of the uh, online publications are hungry for content. So um, I had some published in Taekwondo Times. I've had uh, Mr. Anslow from Totally Taekwondo published probably a couple dozen articles or more. There was a series, Lessons from General Choi, where I basically took my notes and yeah. you know went through them and published them in a the series. Well, are these still uh, available for people? Are they? I don't know what Mr. Anslow's, um, I mean, I my, my deal with Mr. Anslow is that I retained ownership of my articles so that I could use them, circulate them or whatever. Um, I do have copies of everything, which one of my projects one day is to like, I have it in my computer, but not all together. So one of my projects one day is to try and scan like maybe all the lessons from General Choi into a single PDF or something like that. So, but I haven't done that yet. But there's back issues of these magazines now online, isn't there? I've seen that with Taekwondo Times. Taekwondo Times, there might be. But I mean, the ones I did for Taekwondo Times uh, are go back uh, quite a ways. Yeah. Um, I, I, I stopped reading. I got, I would became disappointed with Taekwondo Times. And, and I understand why I did it when um, the editor, who's affiliated with one branch of the ITF, basically 
ignores all the, all the other branches of the ITN. So right. I, I became disillusioned at that time. Yes, sir. So, so do you still produce these articles? Do you, are you working on any at the moment? Or? Uh, I try, oh, the last article I did was probably a couple months ago. It was called uh, Things I Wish I Knew as a Color Belt. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, the outer form chambers on top, you know, and the inner form chambers underneath, you know, things, how you do your stepping and certain other things. That was a couple months ago. So it, now it depends when the spirit moves me or if I read an article, it's like, you know, I think I could do that article a little better than they did it. It, it really frosts me sometimes when you see an article that has a lot of the same stuff that your article had, and they don't give you credit. And in fact, there was one uh, author who published something in Taekwondo Times. Not, no, not Taekwondo Times. I'm sorry. I told it Taekwondo. I, my article about Nam Tehi that appeared in Taekwondo Times had a couple of things that I had never seen before in print. One of them was his explanation for the term autophon. Are you familiar with that? Okay. Are you familiar with Dante his explanation for the name autophon? No, I'm not familiar with that. So no. Okay. So when General Choi, when that, when Sigmund Rhee told General Choi to teach Taekwondo to the troops, and there were supposedly 28 infantry divisions. General Choi formed the 29th Infantry Division. Right, so I know that, yeah. And recruited the top martial, instead of starting from white, everybody from white belts, he recruited a lot of the top martial arts talent, including mm -hmm. Nam Tehi, Han Chak Yo, et cetera, into that division to, de to develop his system and teach his system to the troops. So uh, one of the criticisms of General Choi had always been that he never taught directly. He, uh, he, Nam Tehi was really the teacher. He never taught directly. So I asked Nam Tehi, I said, why uh, did General Choi not teach the troops directly? Why didn't he teach you and then you still taught the troops? He says, because it, it just wasn't done that the, a general would associate with the enlisted men that way. Right. So that's why he, so, so basically that means one of the criticisms that people made had no foundation because that was just the way the military worked. Yeah. Another thing was the, he named the gym, the Odo Kwan. And the literal translation for Odo Kwan is Jim of my way. So the criticism of General Choi was, what an egotist. He made it the Jim of his way. Everybody had to join the Jim of his way. And I asked, when I asked Nam Tehi his, his, his thing about, you know, the Odo Kwan, Jim of my way, he says, yes, that was the Jim of my way. Each person, like speaking in the first person, the Jim for all of us was the better translation. Right. So, so that if you were a Chungdo Kwan guy, you didn't feel like a trader going to a Mudo Kwan gym and vice versa. Yeah. This was the gym where the Chungdo Kwan guys could go, the Mudo Kwan guys could go. It was the gym for all of us. So again, it basically skewered the, one of the criticisms of General Choi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for making that point, sir. That's, that's you know, a fantastic uh, um, explanation for everyone to understand more behind the concepts of these things rather than misjudging it and seeing it in the negative. This is a very positive thing for people. Right. So then when I see that in an article by somebody else, and I called her out, I called her out on it. I said, you know, I don't mind that you used information that you probably got from one of my articles, but I would have liked credit for it. Right. Like, well, I didn't get it from your article. I'm like, well, where did you get it? Said, well, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I got it somewhere, but not from you. And uh, now to his credit, I think um, the guy who wrote The kill a Killing Arts are you familiar with that book, The Killing Art? Yes, sir. Yeah, Alex Gillis, yeah. I think he does, you know, in his book, he has a footnote where he mentions, you know, one of my things or whatever. I actually wrote him a critique, some of the things that I didn't agree with about, uh, you know, that he had this book. I don't know if he changed it in a later edition or not. So, But the interesting thing about The Killing Art was in the 70s, you heard all these stories about people meaning to do harm to General Choi or whatever. And at that time, you know, I thought all those stories were exaggerated. And in fact, one of the events uh, where something happened was General Choi was in Arlington Heights, Illinois, where there was a competition to pick the U.S. team for the ITF championships in Canada. It was hosted by a gentleman named Mac Newton. And Senior Grandmaster Seraph was there and my instructor was there. Now, all three of those guys were about 6'2", good, big, you know, nice stocky guys. 
And the story was that some Koreans showed up to see General Choi and apparently not to be pleasant to him. And in the parking lot, they kind of saw Matt Newton, the master chef, <laughs> Greg Neustra, and they changed their minds and left. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought all the stories were exaggerated that I read in Killing Garth. I'm like, it doesn't seem like they were exaggerated at all. <laughs> So some things, sir, you know firsthand that other people have quoted, um, but maybe you've not had the credit for it in the past. Is that what you mean? Right, right. It's, you know, because if, you know, if you, I was the first one to publish the article about that interpretation of the auto plot. I think I was the first one to, uh, you know, publish the interpretation about, you know, where he was talking about his, uh, you know, the loyalty to different, different gyms, et cetera, and how that worked out. Another interesting story with uh, Grandmaster Nam was uh, a guy with a local school says, oh, we're going to do a demonstration at my school. Do you want to come watch? And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll come watch. And I walked in. It was a typical what I call storefront school. It had like three rows of chairs by the windows, and then it had the workout floor. And I walk in, and the demonstration had already started. Let me just tell the paper. Pull. The demonstration had already started. So I found a seat in the back, and up in the front was Nam Tae and two other Korean instructors. And the, the students are working real hard, and it was, you know, an okay demonstration. But after about four minutes, another Korean walks in, and they st everybody stopped. Oh, everybody bow, Master Cho. Okay, demonstration resumes five minutes, and another Korean walks in. They stop. Okay, everybody bow, Master Peck. Uh, okay, this repeats itself about two or three times, and now. One of the guys at the head table stops and he says, to stop, he says, I want you to know we're up here, we're all master. But Nam he he grandmaster. Okay, great. So now about 10 more minutes go by, and Nam he sees me in the back. I just had lunch with him earlier in the week. And he's like, Master Weiss, come to the front. Everybody's looking at me like, who is this guy? He doesn't look like the other guys up there. He has to bring me a chair, he has me sitting up there at the front with everybody. <laughs> so they do a demonstration, and then one of the kids is history of Taekwondo. Well, 1955, Taekwondo was named, blah, blah, blah. 1973, 1974, WTF was formed, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, you just skipped like 18 years. <laughs> 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 so after it was all over, I go up to the guy and says, you know, Mount you know his history? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, you get your picture taken with him because he's the real deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, sir. I mean, um, <clears throat> I don't think many people know much about Nam Tae Hee other than the, you know, the generation before us, before myself. Um, but you, you met him several times. Well, he was he he ended up in Chicago. So what happened was that's right. Yeah, I'm Chuck and Nam Tae Hee. They were both part of that military demonstration in South Korea. Uh, for your listeners. In 1954 or so, there was a big military demonstration, planes, train, planes, tanks, artillery, all sorts of stuff. And there were like two dozen guys in white uniforms who stood out from everybody else. And Han chuk he was a tremendous kicker. I mean, the rumor, he was only about five foot seven, five foot eight. The rumor yeah. was to kick the rim of a basketball hoop. And Nam tae he was the power guy. And he broke 13 roofing tiles with a downward punch as part of the demonstration. And Simon Lee was so impressed by the by Nam Tae Hee that he had him come to the front and examined his hand to see that he was able to do this. He couldn't believe it. Yeah. And it was that demonstration that so impressed the president that he told General Choi that he needed to teach this to the troops. So in a sense, you know, he was one of the moving forces, Nam Tae Hee, and he was the chief instructor at the Oropan over all these other guys. Yeah. So he was very important then. So... I always wanted to find out more about history, and I had met Han Chak Yo a couple of times and talked to him a few times and always wanted to talk to him more, and then he died. So I said, you know what? I got to see if I can find Nam Tae Hee and talk to him. Yeah. So yes. I talked to Wan Shin. I said, you know where this guy is? I can get a hold of him. And uh, long story short, he put me in touch with him, and I was able to sit down and talk to him. And I said, you know, I'd like you to come to my school and teach a seminar. He's like, well, I'm old. I can't do much, you know. But I said, Sir, all you have to do is go out there and go, hara, dur, set, bet. <laughs> so he like walks into the seminar and he sees like, I, and 
people from all these schools, non-ITF, but whose Korean instructors still have links to the ITF and not to. Well, I had 40 black belts on the floor from all these different schools. And he walked in and his eyes like lit up. Wow. It got energized for all. So I had, and then I repeated that process one more time. Wow. So Amazing. That was good. That was good. Also, another interesting story about him was this local school put on a tournament and they had these flyers hosted by the United States Taekwondo Federation. And I'm like, these guys are not the United States Taekwondo Federation. I'm the representative. They're not part of it. Yeah. And I saw honored guest Nam Tae on the flyer. <laughs> I sent these guys a cease and desist letter on behalf of the United States Taekwondo Federation. Right. So about a week later, I get a call. Nam Tae wants to have lunch with you. So, okay. And I brought Wan Shin with me because he would help translate sometimes. And I walk in, and there are these two Korean instructors from that outfit that hosted that tournament. I'm like, yeah. this is not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, not that says it. So they're like, they're like, they're apologizing to me. Oh, we're sorry. It was a mistake. It shouldn't have said that. Blah, 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 blah. Not that he's like, well, we all friends? No, like, yeah, we're all friends. After we left, my friend launched into it. They're not going to be friends with you. They're not going to be friends with America. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to possibly know that some American guy is of equal status to them. So, you know, right, right. On the outside. So that was a big difference between guys like Nam Tae and Han Shak Yo. You know, they knew their status. There's no way they would feel threatened by my status. Yeah. But if it was a Korean instructor who started training maybe in the 70s, they didn't want it to be known that there might be somebody else of equal status there. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic story, sir. Really, really enjoying that chat together. Uh, uh, <clears throat> getting a picture of everything you're talking about as well and, 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 and hearing these uh, stories about these uh, amazing uh, pioneers of Taekwondo. Um, so, so, sir, you, you know, um, is it okay to mention your year of birth? Because it's the same, isn't it? The same as um, the recognition of the... And it's Taekwondo. I was born in June of 55, and yeah. Taekwondo was born in April of 55. Yeah, so, so you, you know, you, you look in great shape, sir. Are yes. you still training? Do you keep it's right. It doesn't get easier, but you keep, it's no longer are you trying to improve, now you're trying to maintain. Yeah. So do you have your own little routine or, or do you just train with the classes or? No, I, I, I used to, when I was in a different, different, I had a different schedule. I had a bigger break between classes and I would train. Now I just feel for some reason, like teaching the kids for an hour, it feels like training for three hours. <laughs> So my basic, my Taekwondo training at home is uh, I'll do, do Monday and Friday. I do patterns from uh, Sam Il through Tong Il. And then Wednesday, I do Chun Zi through Ju Che. And then in the e two couple evenings a week, I'll do a series of a couple hundred kicks on okay. target tags, et cetera, just to try and you know maintain you know some level of, uh, and then of course, Teaching the adults, I demonstrate and do different things. But uh, you know, when you they tell they tell me that certain heart impact exercises will void the warranty on certain joint replacements, so I stay away from heart impact exercises now. We kick targets, but other than demonstrating on a heavy bag, I won't do I will not do repeated yeah. heavy heavy striking on heavy or kicking on heavy bags. Yeah, no, that's, that's that sounds sensible training, doesn't it? Um, so, so were you a, an all-rounder or were you a patterns person, sparring, power, special, everything? I, I didn't have, you know, I thought it was kind of funny because I always had trouble getting my toes to point down on my side piercing. And I always thought I wasn't training hard enough. I was working hard enough. I had a free instructor grab my foot and twist it, said, we fix, we fix. And all it did was hurt my knees. And then when I was about, how old was I? I was about 50 years old. I had some back problems and I went to the doctor and he says, you have one of the range of motion in your hips. And I'm like, I can do the full splits. I can kick someone my own size in the head. If I have limited range of motion, what does the average person have? And then I realized like when I would be skiing, you know, I thought back when I would be skiing, 
a lot of people's skis were like out 15 degrees, maybe 45 degrees. Mine were out 90 degrees. Okay. And when I was a beginning student, my instructor would say, Earl, don't stand like a duck because my feet would be like out like 90 degrees <laughs> yeah. and I had to really work. And then the orthopedic explained to me is you were born with a congenital misalignment in your hips. And so you can't rotate your feet in further. If they catch this in small children, they put them in braces, they do different things oh, wow. to get things realigned. But 50 years old, forget about it. You're too late. And yeah. he says, and later on, you're going to have hip trouble. And I'm like, ah, I'm not going to have hip trouble. I don't have hip trouble. Unfortunately, yeah. a couple of years later, it turned out it was right. No. <laughs> so God, I had one hip to play so far, but uh, so far the other one's hanging in there. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so were you an all-rounder in the taekwondo? Uh, well, I, my point was with not being able to turn my turn, get my feet to the classic position or whatever, I was never a great pattern person. In fact, um, one of my best compliments from General Choi was, you're not so bad. Okay, yeah. Because <laughs> they call for volunteers, everybody be like, look like this. I'm like, God, myself and another guy, we had no misgivings about being great pattern people. Yeah. But somebody had to get up there so he could do his thing, so we would do it. So if I got him, you're not so bad, he was supposed to sit down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was sparring was, I was a little, sparring I did a little better. I, I won some local stuff, but nothing, uh, nothing big. So you know, that was, that was uh, basically my, you know, for, for you know, it, there's all sorts of levels, you know, local, it doesn't matter whether it's wrestling, or baseball, or football, or gymnastics. It's one thing to be good at the local level. Next thing to be good at the next higher level. One thing to be good at the next higher level. Next thing to be good at international or even gold medal international champion. I was never at that level. Sure. Yeah, but um, the, the essence, the trueness of Taekwondo, it's an individual thing, isn't it? We, we like to compare and contrast and enjoy that experience but ultimately it's it, it's our thing right. my greatest competition biggest competitor biggest challenge is always myself could i be a little bit better can i do this a little bit better a little bit faster a little you know until you reach a certain age it's like can i do this as good as yesterday <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely sir fantastic so that's where i'm at can i do this as good as yesterday it's absolutely yeah one hundred percent. So, um, okay, sir, it's been wonderful spending this time with you. I greatly appreciate it. time with you too, sir. Thank you so much. Um, if you're ever in the Chicago area, look me up. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're here. Bring your uniform. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to, sir. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I'd love to, sir. It's been a great time. As I say, lots of stories. Appreciate your time and um, and uh, sharing your knowledge. Um, do you have any any uh, advice for instructors? The only advice I, I guess I have for instructors is, you know, um, and I wrote, I had an article in Totally Taekwondo Times about this, about teaching the three different types of learners. You know, anybody could teach the, the great student. That's not a big deal. Teaching the student who's having some trouble grasping or whatever, that's a little tougher. So, you know, always try and hit the three main types of, of teaching, which is, you know, the auditory learner, which learns by listening and understanding. And so you explain it to them. The visual learner who learns by watching. And if you're getting a little long in the tooth like I am, sometimes you have to have the younger person demonstrate. And then finally, the tactile learner, which learns by the feel of something. And you actually may have to move their limbs in certain directions to try and get them to understand how it is that they need to move. Yeah. Absolutely so, yeah. So it's finding the levers for the different people, how they can take the information on. It's a different, yes. different for everybody. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, best wishes to you and yours. Yeah, you too, sir. Thank you for your time. All right, bye-bye.